So I was working with uh, strategies on saying, okay, where should a company like Equinor play in that space? How can we play a meaningful role to uh, build up a hydrogen business? There is no commodities market for hydrogen today. Okay? So there is no price for hydrogen at the moment. But then if you want to produce it in um, enough scale, uh, you, need, you need to create a market. Hello. And welcome to season two of Conversations on Climate, the podcast series which has been developed in partnership with the London Business School's Alumni Energy Club, in which I've been leading a series of conversations with experts from around the world exploring the biggest challenge of our time, climate change. Around 80% of people who listen to this podcast haven't hit the follow button. If I could ask you for a small favor, if you do enjoy our conversations, please do hit that follow button on your app. It would help us in the show more than I could possibly say. Thank you and enjoy the conversation. Julia, thank you very much for talking to us today. Uh, we're uh, going to speak a little bit about uh, hydrogen. Uh, could you possibly give us a little bit of uh, introduction into your own kind of background and interest in the, in, in the subject? Um, yeah, sure. I, um, so I started working with hydrogen projects as part of my role as a as a senior advisor on the corporate strategy team at, uh, at Equinor when, when I was uh, still with the company. Um, and Equinor is an, um, it might be an interesting example of why oil and gas companies or why energy companies decided to start looking seriously into hydrogen in the first place. Norway obviously is a big exporter of gas uh, to Europe. Um, it's certainly the biggest exporter of gas to the UK, as well known. And the expectation is that the demand for natural gas is going to decline over time because European countries are looking to decarbonize their energy mix. They want to replace their, uh, their power, the electricity generation system away from fossil fuels, certainly away from coal, uh, but then sooner rather than later away from natural gas as well. Um, and there will come a point where, and it, for those uh, gas exporting countries, what's going to be the, uh, the demand for their, uh, for their core exports, what's going to be the demand for their gas exports. So that was the starting point for when companies start thinking like, hmm, maybe we need to take the, the, the hydrogen discussion seriously. Uh, we need to start seeing uh, how we can over time transform that uh, natural gas production into blue hydrogen production, how we can combine um, the carbon capture and storage uh, with hydrogen, how we can basically decarbonize the natural gas and then sell uh, hydrogen as a, as a fuel, as an energy source um, into the markets where we're selling our natural gas. That was the starting point. And then um, obviously the, the thinking was always that, okay, so we'll start with blue hydrogen where you're basically reforming natural gas. Uh, but then over time we know that uh, the um, and in more and more countries will say that, well, actually, you're still producing fossil fuels and we really want to move away from fossil fuels. So blue hydrogen is not um, accepted anymore. So we want to move to green hydrogen. And, and it, that is the, the pure um, and a clean energy that we have in mind for our future. Um, so I was working with uh, strategies on saying, okay, where should a company like Equinor play in that space? How can we play a meaningful role to uh, build up a hydrogen business. There is no commodities market for hydrogen today. I mean, the, the hydrogen is sold point to point. It's a byproduct of your refining process. You sell to some industrial customers and then that's it. It's an individual contract that you put in place. So there is no price for hydrogen at the moment. But then if you want to produce it in um, enough scale, you need to start a, uh, you, need, you need to create a market. What should be our role in creating that market and how can we um, make a difference, how can we target some of the biggest consumers of or, you know, either existing or potential consumers of hydrogen um, and then and create a roadmap uh, to uh, fulfill their needs of, of that gas over time. How can we create a transition plan for ourselves as well where if we think that people will demand green hydrogen going forward and uh, we start here but then over time that's where we want to get to. Uh, so that's what uh, I was working with uh, for quite some time, you know, on strategies to not only create the roadmap, the investment plan for Equinor as a company, but also thinking about how the, the whole hydrogen and CCS market was going to be created, mainly here in Northern Europe, uh, but more and more as well in other parts of the world, especially on, in, in the US, for example. 
So hydrogen, it's a, it's a gas. It's a it's a flammable gas. Yes. That um, you can. That's also a component of water, like two elements of hydrogen, one hydrogen, uh, one element of oxygen, and the traditional way of making hydrogen, it, of of producing hydrogen, like from these processes. Could you tell us a little bit about how hydrogen is produced? Oh yeah, sure. It's produced through the um, traditionally through the refining process of oil and gas. So refi uh, on your refinery uh, process, uh, part of your byproduct um, is, um, is hydrogen that you can either use it to, um, as another input to further refine your um, your fossil fuels, or you can use it for some other industrial processes as, as well. You can use it for steel manufacturing. You can use it as um, any, uh, any, there are any number of sources for hydrogen as a gas. Um, as part of industrial process. It's usually used as a catalyst for some other um, different stages of uh, industrial processes. Um, but as you say, it's a flammable gas as well. So like, um, uh, like natural gas, which is uh, CH4, um, which is methane in a way, um, it can be used um, as a source of energy. And the good thing about hydrogen is that when you burn it, um, you generate energy on one hand and then generate water, uh, water on the other hand. That's why hydrogen has become such a big topic these days, because in a way you can burn it and not generate carbon dioxide as a byproduct of uh, uh, the energy generation process. Um, that's good, but the problem is that, anyway, how do you generate hydrogen? Um, you can either uh, generate it with, um, by reforming natural gas, so you run your natural gas production through a process and then you separate the CO2 on one hand and then the hydrogen on the other one. Since uh, natural gas is uh, CH4, um, you have H2, which is a hydrogen gas on one hand, and then you have the CO2 going uh, the other way. Um, and um, the problem is that you have to install a carbon capture and storage facility to be able to do that as well. So um, you address the carbon emissions, um, and at the same time you have clean hydrogen on the other side. Um, some people don't like that approach because basically, uh, as you're saying, it might as well be just a way of keeping your gas production going without necessarily addressing the, um, uh, some of the other uh, effects of fossil fuel production. Um, but it could be a way of um, starting up a um, hydrogen market. Um, and it could be a, maybe a good way to uh, decarbonize some other industrial sectors, industrial clusters, where there's a big reliance on, on hydrogen as a catalyst, um, and where the carbon capture and storage that you install for reforming the natural gas and producing hydrogen could also be used for other processes. That's what is known as the blue hydrogen, in a way, where the, the hydrogen that's produced through uh, natural gas as an, as a, an input source. Uh, but you also have the, what's called the green hydrogen, which is a hydrogen that you generate through the electrolyzer. So you have water as an input, you um, apply electricity or apply another energy source there, and then your electrolyzer will separate the water molecules, it will separate the oxygen from the hydrogen, you have hydrogen as a gas uh, as an output. Um, that's great. It's clean hydrogen because you're not uh, using any gas to produce the, the hydrogen. The problem is it demands energy, it demands electricity as an input. Um, and the more expensive that electricity, the more uh, expensive that um, uh, hydrogen production becomes through that uh, um, electrolysis process. Um, and then what um, and some companies are playing with, and that's the, the, you have like loads of like different commercial models trying to emerge out of that. Maybe you can use excess renewable production. So for example, you have a big solar farm, you have a lot of um, um, electricity production from the solar farm, um, the sun is shiny, uh, but then you might be producing more electricity than, you, than the grid can take, than, than the demand for electricity at that point. If you can't store that electricity in any other way, what do you do with that excess? More likely than not, you have to curtail your production, so basically you're just wasting um, available capacity to produce because and it, the, the balance between the demand and supply at that point in time um, is, is not uh, enough to actually take into account the excess production. 
So uh, the theory goes, maybe you can use some of that excess production to uh, power up an electrolyzer and produce uh, green hydrogen at the same time. Um, maybe, <laughs> but that, th th that, those are some of the models that are being tested out. Um, of course, that, that all comes down to the cost of the electrolyzer. It comes down to the cost if, of if the electrolyzer. Have infinite free electrolyzers, why would you not do that? Unfortunately, right now, electrolyzers are very, very expensive. So. It comes down to the cost of electrolyzer. It comes down to the cost of the renewable electricity that you're having an input. Obviously, if it's free, great. Uh, if it's not free, how, how do those things add up? Yeah. What would have to be the cost of the hydrogen that you produce to be able to... Um, to pay for the, the, the whole process of producing that hydrogen. I believe that this is actually um, going to evolve uh, maybe in a faster way than most of us expect in a way. And it, it's, it, it's too easy to be skeptical about hydrogen, um, especially because and it, like right now, especially green hydrogen is expensive to produce. Uh, there's not enough um, renewable energy available to produce it in, in big um, quantities. Um, renewable electricity production is uh, intermittent by nature, so how are you going to have a stable and a constant production of hydrogen w you, with that kind of um, um, energy pattern? And that's before you even talk about uh, compression and moving it around. That's, that's yeah. even before you yeah. talk about how much it actually costs, uh, the whole thing. But on the other hand, because uh, of other bottlenecks on the development of the renewable energy business, maybe hydrogen will have a strong role to play. So for example, I. And previously we mentioned challenges with building infrastructure, building grids to transport uh, electricity from the place where it's produced to the place where it's needed. Hydrogen can certainly play a role to store electricity uh, when it's uh, produced and not needed. And it can certainly play a role to resolve some of the bottlenecks on grid access, for example. Maybe if I don't have enough grid access at some point, I can install an electrolyzer and um, use it to balance the grid load and actually help the grid um, along the way. Green hydrogen industry is going to develop, maybe not as fast as some people uh, and they want to, uh, to have the industrial quantities of hydrogen that are being planned for um, in places like the European Union, for example, or even the, the UK. It might be a challenge because you, ha you need huge amounts of um, uh, renewable power to produce that much hydrogen, or you need huge amounts of um, carbon capture and storage installed on gas production to actually get there. Um, but on the other hand, the more that it is produced and the more electrolyzers that are produced and so on, the more likely that you are going to see the same learning uh, curve effects as in other industries. The more electrolyzer you produce, maybe the lower the unit cost of each electrolyzer and the cheaper that the whole thing will get and then the more hydrogen will be produced over time. I am a strong believer that this will get there, whether the learning curve will uh, be uh, as steep as some other uh, learning curves like with solar and so on, I don't know. But I'm sure that um, um, the learning curve of electrolyzers and the cost of electrolyzers will go down in time, the same way as with batteries for electric vehicles and, uh, and other technologies that are critical for, uh, for the energy transition. Fantastic. And where do you see hydrogen, the future of hydrogen? Like, do you see it as being ubiquitous and everybody's like heating everybody's homes and moving everyone's cars, or see it as, but as a more specialist and just purely simple industries or whatever, or somewhere in between? I see hydrogen as playing a bigger role, um, certainly at first, on, um, on addressing the needs to decarbonize some of the big industrial clusters. So if and it, here in the UK, for example, we have like the Humber region, we have the Teesside region. And I think the industries in and around the Humber estuary in the UK, they are probably one of the, they are certainly the biggest source of carbon emissions in the country. And they are one of the biggest source of emissions on an industrial cluster in Europe as well. So those big industrial clusters here in the UK, in Northern Europe and so on, those are prime um, places where you can use hydrogen and you can use carbon capture and storage to have a meaningful impact on a whole region, on a whole industrial base um, on the short term as well. Uh, so instead of burning natural gas to generate electricity, you can burn um, hydrogen or you can install a carbon capture and storage process on that power plant and then you have a, a clean um, energy 
production. Um, instead of trying to get rid of your steel plants on an industrial um, cluster, for example, maybe you can install carbon capture and storage there, decarbonize that, uh, that uh, steel plant. Or maybe you can use hydrogen instead of um, other uh, inputs, or maybe you can even use electricity as part of the steel making process uh, to decarbonize those, uh, those big industrial clusters. Those would be the early applications for hydrogen. In a way that displaces the traditional use of gray hydrogen or the, 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 the dirty hydrogen, the hydrogen produced directly from fossil fuels, uh, but it also helps to decarbonize those industrial clusters. And that has a, already a meaningful impact on the countries that are able to do that. Um, I see the um, uh, use of hydrogen on uh, residential heating, for example, as a bit more far-fetched. Um, it might be blended with natural gas and then you, and then you don't have to invest on changing your boiler to a hydrogen boiler. Um, but wouldn't it be better to try to invest directly into you know, heat pumps and electrifying the heating system directly instead of trying to get a, a halfway solution with hydrogen? Not to mention that you're going to have challenges to distribute hydrogen across the existing system and so on. So um, the more distributed the system, the harder it is to use hydrogen as a way to decarbonize those systems. In my mind, hydrogen is a good tool to decarbonize the energy mix in big industrial clusters and um, in places where you can have, you can have like big storages of hydrogen. So maybe it can, use, it can be used in certain instances as a as a way to balance the grid, as a way to have energy storage. Um, uh, it can be used maybe in, you know, on the transportation sector, especially on places where you have um, a, a fixed pattern of transportation from you know, point to point. So maybe on, um, on ferries, for example, that could be a good way to decarbonize. It certainly can be used to decarbonize some of the worst offenders on the transportation sector. So for example, it can uh, displace bunker fuel uh, as, a, and as a transportation fuel for, uh, for the shipping sector. So there are certain um, uses of hydrogen that make sense. Uh, the more distributed that you think about that, the harder it is to make the case. So for example, if you're using hydrogen fuel cells um, as a transportation uh, fuel, so for, for example, if you're using it for, um, for light duty vehicles, uh, how many and a few stations are you actually going to need to be able to um, uh, fuel those cars with hydrogen, for example. So the, the more distributed the system, the harder it is to use hydrogen as a meaningful, um, uh, as a meaningful clean fuel in a way to, uh, to decarbonize the energy mix. Well, thank you very much. You've been enormously generous with your time and uh, massively appreciated. Thank, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining us on that conversation. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, we hope that you uh, learned something. Uh, if you did enjoy it, please feel free to leave a five-star review and uh, to subscribe to, uh, to any of our channels. And uh, we'll be sure to keep you updated on future productions. This series is produced by United Renewables in collaboration with the London Business School Alumni Energy Club.